sure to share that. All right. I think we're live. Yeah. All right. Good evening, everybody. And welcome to a good, another Good Friday night on the uh, Coach's Corner. Um, we have a little bit of technical difficulties, so we're a little bit delayed tonight, but we appreciate you uh, being patient and uh, stand by and, and joining us for tonight. Um, we have uh, some of our, our regular coaches tonight for an episode on uh, developing the fighter's mind. Uh, we've got his Grace Branos, uh, Sir Akshay Masadi, who's going to be uh, kicking this off for us. Uh, Vice Councilor Tristan and uh, Vice Councilor Sagan will be joining us uh, momentarily um, as soon as he gets back in. So, um, as always, uh, feel free to ask questions, and uh, we'll we'll go ahead and post those to the to the coaches and see if we can get an answer for you. Um, if we don't get to your question uh, during the show, we will definitely do our best to uh, get to that um, uh, on the on the SEA Coaches Corner or through the uh, live stream later. So go ahead and post your question up or your comments or whatever, and we'll, we'll try to do our best to get to it. But if we can't, it's not personal. It's just so much time and uh, all we have there. So uh, uh, with that, I think I'll go ahead and turn this over to you, Akshay Masadis. All right. Well, thank you, sir. Um, hey, everybody. Tonight we're doing Developing the Fighter's Mind. It's kind of a deep dive down the rabbit hole. There's a whole lot of, uh, I would say, a whole maybe a lack of consistent vernacular and vocabulary and training methods for this. But I think as uh, we've been going through this year, we've started really expanding on this particular topic and it's a great one for us to cover today in the coach's corner. Um, mental, uh, combining your, your mindset, um, how people approach things along with your physicality as a fighter um, takes, a, takes a bit to combine those two things. Uh, it's one thing to work over and over on your flat snap and then you'll focus on your footwork and then trying to join those things in concert um, takes a lot of discipline and we practice that a lot but we don't practice the mindset and how to enter the fight with the correct mindset how to uh, incorporate um, those learning pieces into our um, our mind so that they flow so we don't have to actively tell yourself you're going to throw this technique or you're going to move here or move your opponent um, the first part of this I think just to touch on and we talk about it we've talked about it at practice we've talked about it in some of our other episodes is discipline and in this instance it's that mental discipline and um, um, nurturing that on a day-to-day -day basis you know setting up good habits good rhythms to your life and your flow that are that are consistent um, so that you get in the habit of being consistent and doing the things even when you don't want to do it. We've talked about, hey, it's time to go to practice tonight, but you had a rough day at work. You don't feel like putting your armor on. I know Bronis has said, hey, just go to practice. Go and watch. Go and help somebody else train. Go and be an observer. Go and hang out in kibitz. But you're not breaking that discipline of going to a practice. Uh, you're not breaking that habit so that you're easy, easy, easier to come back to that uh, next week and you don't develop new habits of not going to practice. So the first thing with uh, the mental aspect of what we do is, I think, keeping good mental habits, keeping good uh, clarity with those. The other part that I think gets a little difficult and you, this changes from location to location is um, vocabulary, vernacular. I think we all use some different words and different terms to describe kind of the difference between that uh, front analytical brain and the um, part of the lizard brain, the big mind, the no mind. Um, the difference is one is reacting with information that it already knows to solve a puzzle. That's the big mind, the no mind, and the front <laughs> brain is, um, it's taking the time to solve the puzzle. It's taking the time, it, it, we don't have a quick answer, so it's going to engage and really analyze things. Um, you guys have some thoughts on kind of naming those or how you differentiate those? Well, I think there's, it's important. The mental aspect is kind of a, the term mental is a huge umbrella that covers a lot. And you've, you've kind of described a, a bit of some of those different ones, which is the mental discipline of how do you structure your training, your daily habits and whatnot. Then there's all the way down to the mentality of some, they say the marshal says lay on, and now you are in a mental chess match at that moment. And there's a broad, spectrum 
in there of, of the different aspects of building your mental, the mental side of your fighting. And one of the things we talked about before, as setting this up was to realize that the, uh, if you looked at three different tiers of fighting or combat, there's the physical, there's the mental in the middle, and then there's the spiritual at the top. And I'm, I don't mean by spiritual, religious or anything like that, but it is the inside part of you that the mentality expresses. There are people who are, are just in their own heart and spirit are very assertive, very aggressive. The, the mentality that is linked with that is very important. That will affect the, your mental aspect. And, and these, even the physical has profound effects on the mental. So you can't just isolate the mental aspect of fighting and say, I just want to hone this one thing. It is linked, it, inter, it is not only linked, intertwined with the physical and it's intertwined with the spiritual. And so as you build the ment mental part, you're building the physical part and the spiritual part all together. So we have to appreciate that we're not just isolating one component of fighting and talking about that. It has profound links to, to the others. And if you're weak in the physical, you can be strong in the, in the, in the mental and vice versa, but those, those have to be developed together to work together very well. Um, and it's, we really bitten off a lot here in this subject of even talking about the mental aspect of fighting just because of that it's and just within it, it's, it's a huge topic. And I think, I think just kind of getting to the point where we've got some definitions and some understanding when you're talking about physical and mental and spirit, now we get into the whole training. And so, well, before we, before we go to training, can let, let's cover spirit a little bit, because that's, it tends to be something that I think a lot of people are still confused about. And some of that spirit to me, and, and Tristan, you can verify, this is where some might come is, is you, you kind of mentioned it in the beginning, but we can train physically and understand that we, we know that discipline and structure and physical techniques is all of those physical pieces being developed, your, your workout, your endurance, all of those things. The mind is understanding how to build something and, and tactically how to execute it. That spirit piece is that piece where you believe that you're ready and you're, you're confident and and you don't have doubts and you, you're clear and your, your, your mind is clear to execute and think about other things. Um, to me, that's the spiritual piece. And not a lot of people talk about that. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, I've seen this before. I, people come, it's like, I'm I want to train for crown tourney. And you train them hard physically and mentally for a while. But there's a spiritual piece on that or a confidence piece. If, if, if the guy comes the day before crown tourney and you beat the hell out of him. He's going to go down into crown tourney broken spiritually. He may, he may still has that same physical ability. He still has that same mental ability, but spiritually he's broken because he doesn't believe in himself. And to build that is something that's super difficult that people don't even talk about much. And, and you, that's something you have to build in people too, that the, the building that, belief in themselves and in what they're learning would, would you agree tristan is this the spiritual yeah. piece that yeah um, that, that's definitely a part of it and just to show there's like the mental there's 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 some different aspects yes. too for example uh when i took up aikido i had an instructor who was very much an introvert by spirit he was a rather passive individual his techniques reflected it his mental state reflected that he was really good at accepting attacks coming in and redirecting them and by turning. And he was very patient and very calm. On the other side of that, I'm a very assertive person. And so I was in the direct attack uh, kind of mode. The techniques of Aikido that, are, that incorporate that, called a Rimi or entry, I took to like a duck to water. Uh, and he and I were kind of at the opposite ends of the spectrum, merely because of what our spirit was underneath an assertive personality versus a more passive personality. And I got to learn the side of patience and, and yes. drawing out time by, by the physical techniques and enhancing that side of my own spirit. 
uh, but it, it had the physical layer, the mental layer, and the spiritual layer all developed at the same time. Um, and it was, that had everything to do with what was deep inside of us of my wanting to be assertive because that's just my personality. <clears throat> and I think every SCA fighter I've seen starts from that standpoint of what is, what's inside their heart inherently before they start to articulate, okay, what are the physical techniques I'm going to learn? Now, what is the mentality that I, I will naturally try to start with and then hone later through development? Awesome. Exactly. All right. Yeah. And it's interesting that you gentlemen have brought all three of those out because they are distinct and they are all players in this fighter aspect, right? Mental, physical training is about one set of things, about trying to get this thing up here to recognize why and these things to do how and when. And then you're asking, who are you on, on fight day? You're, as my trainee, you're doing great. Who are you going to show me when we fight? Because who you show me this week may be different than who you show me next week and who you show everybody in a tournament. And all of them, as we're, as we're saying, they can be trained. But they are important from the beginning to admit and recognize that they all exist. And as we recognize and we admit that, when we do train, we can identify mental, physical, spirit. And okay. And we, and we become, as students, we become aware, you know, as, as Tristan mentioned with his sensei, I became aware of that so I could ask my sensei, which piece is lacking? And he would, you know, be more than willing to point out which one it was, and then we would work on it. But up front, it is very important to admit to yourself, recognize for yourself, and then train to all three of these points because they are very important. And I think some of the building blocks for spirit, I mean, correct me if, if you disagree, but I think um, trust is part of spirit, trusting yourself that you've built all of the physical and mental things where you can trust yourself to just do them when they're needed. Um, intensity, having that, being able to control the intensity to, like Tristan was saying, be very aggressive or to pull that back. And when you can control both sides of that coin in one person and you have the ability to yo-yo that and manipulate your, your impact with another human being by varying that intensity and getting them to mirror that, that is a very spiritual thing for me. And then uh, I had one more, uh, intensity, trust. Oh, I forget the last one, but I also see the, the anti part of the spirit, the stuff that challenges that fear. Like you were saying, doubt, if you fought somebody so hard right before a crown and you've broken them, that fear and the doubt are in there. Now they're reactionary instead of responsive. and the spirits diminished a bit, and then all you have is technique and mind without spirit, um, it's easier to manipulate. So I would say that spirit is probably the hardest one to maintain and, and control. It's the easiest one to lose. Mm -hmm. Hey, Sean, you wanna cover that question? Yeah, I, I also wanted to throw in a little bit about the, about the spirit mindset as well as, as part of the, the spirit uh, aspect is, you know, that is to some extent, it is who you are um, as, as a fighter where, you know, you have the physical, which is what you do, how you do, you know, like my mechanics and, and are, are different from Ronald's mechanics. And that's the how, and that's the physical side of it. The mental side of it is, um, you know, is, is the why as, as Sagan was, was saying, but ultimately when you get to that spirit, that's like, that's who you are. Um, and being confident in who you are, wh whatever that may be, um, is a huge part of, uh, of, of the fight. Um, and, and I think I'll, I'll have, I'll have some examples later, but essentially I think it kind of comes down to the, the old outage of, you know, to thine own self be true, where as long as you are true to who you are as a fighter, then you can be satisfied with 
the outcome of of the fight regardless of whether you win or lose as long as 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 you are you are executing as best you can and and being true to yourself as as a fighter i mean i can handle being beaten by somebody that is just better than me but i have a hard time handling being beaten because i was not true to myself as a fighter and and i think that's that's part of this the this the spiritual part of it as well um, you know, a lot of, and, and, and I guess that leads up to the question that, that we had that came up here is how do Eastern martial arts different from, from Western martial arts? And my understanding of, of a lot of the Eastern disciplines, uh, particularly the Kung Fu and the Shaolin stuff, um, is that martial arts was a path to enlightenment. Um, it was a, it was a mechanism for, for finding that spirituality and finding that, that enlightenment and that it was, it was, so much less about the physical execution of the things as it was about finding that enlightenment. And I think, you know, Tristan, you know, you, you practicing some of the Eastern uh, disciplines, um, you know, you appreciate your take on that. And then, you know, maybe you can kind of start into how you see, especially having done both the Western disciplines. And by that, I, I take that to mean, you know, um, uh, European martial arts, uh, you know, SEA combat, HEMA, I-33 and that sort of stuff and how those how those compare to uh, some of the, the hard and soft disciplines of, of the Eastern martial arts with the Kung Fu and the karate and the Taekwondo and what have you. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and before I do that, I just wanted to mention if, if and I liked how you, you described the spiritual as what you inherently are, that's who you are. Never think that training won't actually enhance your spirit. You are, will hone you're not just stuck with whoever you are, your, your own doubts or your fears. You're not trapped by them. You can work past them. And you do that through the physical training, through the mental, you build your spirit stronger. Um, you become less afraid, more confident. All of that stuff happens. Um, it's easy to think, well, I'm inherently slow, so I can never be faster, or I'm inherently uh, timid, so I cannot be assertive. All of that's garbage. You can, you can do with yourself whatever you desire. And that's part of the will and part of that aspect of your spirit. That's something that no one else can just give you, regardless of how many motivation videos and, what, and books you read that has to come from inside you with that desire. Um, those motivation things can help, but they won't do it all for you. If you want it, you can do it. You can build your, your spirit, your mental, your physical. Um, I just wanted to get that out there because I've seen many, many people beat themselves up saying, I can't do this. I can't, Yeah, uh, you know, it just seems yeah. so difficult or so yes. hard or it's so distant. Like that advanced skill is so far away from them. They can't c comprehend the idea of that long journey that it's going to take to get them where they want to go or yeah. farther along the path. And if there's one thing I could tell anybody starting out or even just dealing with that, one of those first plateaus where they get frustrated and they just go, I can't imagine I've stalled and I can't even imagine why I've stopped or that I, this might be, be it. This might be as good as I can ever get. Um, it's that persistence and that comes out of your spirit to say, I'm not going to accept defeat and I'm going to keep going on right. and I will get better. And you will. Absolutely. Right. And one of the earliest things I was taught on the mental side was don't get in your own way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because when you're first starting out, yes, it can be challenging. Yes, it can be confusing. Yes, it can be it can be somewhat demoralizing. Yes, it can be disconnected. But beyond that, once you get once you get some success, once you get some confidence, as we're talking about here, and you work all three of these, it's like, oh, well, you know, back then, yeah, I wow, I, I really was in my own way. Right. And the spirit of like uh, uh, Zan Shin, right? Ever awareness with no mind left over. Right, you've done it, right? But at first, your mind is very busy figuring out, okay, so this thing in my hand is a stick. This other thing, yeah, well, it's a board, right? Or, okay, so they've handed me a stick. Yeah, that's, that's good in the beginning. But the realization of what's over here, what's at the end? And a lot of times in the beginning, we're not taught about these three aspects. We're taught about this is a stick and this is a board. And that, again, we're coming back to how do trainers make and help the student and the trainee be successful? And, and this is where the rubber meets the road.
And to get to the, the question of the difference between the Eastern and the Western arts, uh, regardless of the obvious, which is there are different physical techniques, the principles of combat are universal because we are all built the same way. And you will find the same principles of combat, including the mental side, in the Western arts, in the Eastern arts, in combat all over the planet. Um, they're usually expressed in different language, uh, different terms, even some that are very colorful and, and remarkably unique, but the principles are all still pretty much the same. Um, that's because strategy is universal. It's, it's, there is no custom strategy that fits one area versus another. Um, you'll just find different ways of, that they articulate it. Um, I will say that the Eastern arts have the benefit and the curse of a living lineage. They have developed into essentially like pseudo religion type cults and they've where they've worshiped, you know, their predecessors, the Eastern arts are pretty much a dead lineage. There's not a live, live lineage of instructors handed down. Um, most of that, those arts were largely abandoned. And therefore, they were not worshipped as godlike or some kind of incredible, um, you know, personalities. And to me, that's the difference. The European arts tend to have a more pragmatic approach, and they don't. They, they treat it just like combat. Like uh, a woodworker talks about how they build cabinetry and how they do woodwork. It's just a craft. The Eastern arts have taken on a more almost mystical approach to what they do. And it's kind of as part of their culture. I mean, look at the Japanese tea ceremony. Why would you need to take four hours to make a cup of tea? Like, it's a ritual. They've, they've liked to ritualize their approach to things. They love the aesthetic. They love the ritual. They love the respect. They love the history. And they've articulated it into this huge thing. But from a physical and mental standpoint, it's just the same as Western martial arts, if that makes yeah, the sense. J Japanese tea ceremony has nothing to do with tea. Right. <laughs> yep all right octa why don't you go ahead and move on on your topics okay well and, and just to kind of close that opening part is i think it's important as trainers and coaches that we let our students know that these things exist we're going to teach you how to throw a flat snap you're going to have to use your minds to comprehend that and to store these things and on the way we're going to build that spirit this is where you're at today we always talk about in various episodes emptying your cup from time to time, you need to go back and I'm not saying empty it, but maybe clean it out a little bit. Take a look and, and reevaluate the truth. And that's a big thing for me. Who you were yesterday is not who you are tomorrow. And so give yourself a break every once in a while and clean out that thought like Tristan said, hey, I'm slow or I'm this. Redefine yourself. Allow those definitions to evolve along with your training. By the way, I, I wanted to jump in with one quick uh, thing that I always do with students. And every once in a while, I'll have one who'll say, oh, I, I can't do that, or I'm not very good at this. And I just say, yet. Yep. And they, they'll look at me and they'll kind of nod and, okay, yeah, I, I, all right. Yep, I'm not good at this yet. Yep. I've uh, it's a way to blunt my, that when it shows up. Yeah, I've told my squire I was done hearing the word I can't. Yep. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear it anymore. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not allowed. I don't understand is okay, but I can't. Um, all right, so getting into training. So we've talked about practice. We've talked about how to throw flat snaps and all these other techniques, but training the mind um, and the spirit. So how to practice. Um, again, just like the other things we practice, don't forget setting your victory conditions. Um, know that you're going to learn in chunks and deliberately practice. Just don't show up and spar and expect to evolve your mental and spirit game just from not putting any focus in it so just like um training anything else it has to be deliberate and you got to set yourself up with some victory conditions um, i look at it as building kind of that technical library of foundational movement techniques so that you can build confidence if you're confident in your footwork if you're confident in your sword mechanics and you have a toolbox to, to start your mental game, then your spirit game can keep up with that. You start to foster that and grow that. Uh, I have this kind of broken out into several different uh, sections between building that technical library, creating those 
learning aspects. So combining your footwork, your body mechanics, your hand mechanics into these chunks of techniques that you then can put back into. So for lack of a better term, your responsive brain, your lizard brain, and so that it start to create those so that when your brain sees a response from a when or a why, it executes that. You throw that intensity out there. Um, developing that calm mind through practice. So I kind of categorize people in their, in their lizard brains as either reactionary or responsive. A reactionary fighter takes in that input and they just have to, re they react. You do it if you fake somebody and they flinch, that's their reaction. That's what they've trained themselves to do. Or they throw a blow because you've, you've triggered them. A responsive fighter gets to deliberately decide how they respond to that input. And it's just, it's heartbeats, but it's that foundation of training. Um, and you're starting to develop that, um, that lizard brain, that no mind connection with and incorporating it with your technique. Uh, feedback for those it. people uh, and, and i want to put this one in here too because a lot of times people especially brand new fighters have a hard time understanding or hard time appreciating what it's like to have that lizard brain program to to respond without even their thinking about it but i think everybody has had this happen where you're sitting there and you see like an orange roll off a table and your hand just shoots out and grabs it before you had any chance to think about it or a glass tips over or something and you snatch it up before you even had a chance to think. And that's really an exa a real life example that everybody's experienced of what we are trying to train our body to do. And that when they connect with that, most people understand, okay, I, I, I get that that's possible because they'll, they'll all say I've been faster than mm -hmm. and more accurate than I ever imagined I could be. Um, but that's, that's that lizard brain. So, uh, you know, my, my point on the lizard brain piece is, and I, I, you, I get a million questions about this. Lizard brain is that, for me, is that place where we train that thousand blows so that we don't have to think about it. Absolutely. So that they just execute as fast as it happens. And, but in between those thousand blows, we're in, analyzing we're probing we're building the chess match between two people I, I think too many people think oh I, i'm i'm just going to go out there and 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 be empty and and lizard brain the whole fight no <laughs> and now now don't get me wrong there are some people that are so good at probing and and have a routine of how they they fight people that they don't have to think very much about that routine because it's just natural but there's analysis going through that whole thing. I saw this open. Now I'm going to pressure over here because he may be thinking about that still and, and be, defend it. So now I'm going to go two or three more deep. While I'm going two or three more deep on these fakes, I'm also categorizing what were the weaknesses on those two or three. Then I'm going to go back to this one and either double test it with more focus or actually throw it and then see what the response was, but I still have three, four more things in my queue, you know? So there's, there's analysis going on there, but, you know, it, and again, some people do that faster and with time it comes faster, but with an unclear head, in other words, am I moving right? Did I throw the blow right? Is, am I picky, am I blocking right? Now it becomes harder and harder to make those decisions faster and faster because we're clouding our head. And as a good fighter, we want to cloud your opponent's head because the more you cloud their head, the less, the, the, the harder it is for them to make decisions. And that helps in the fight. So, that, you know, this is that complexity around the mind, right? I, I think that's the, the, the big piece here. Yeah, Ronos, I've got a really good example of that uh, most recently. Um, <laughs> so, uh, really, I your just, highness? <laughs> <laughs> I was just talking to Okta before we went live here. Um, there was a, a series of events that happened uh, uh, before I finished the final fight in Crown last weekend uh, where um, I, I went back and looked at the video and, and, I, and, I, and I saw this this exchange of, you know, my opponent presented pressure and then I responded with pressure back and then I eased off on that and that created room for him to, um, uh, to feel comfortable engaging space 
in which then I was able to, to take that range and execute. And it was this whole, whole exchange of things that happened that I got to see in the video. None of that stuff was going through my head as it happened. I, I, I simply responded to, to the stimulus as, as it was going on, but there was no, there was no mental thought of, of any of that. And I think that's the, that's the lizard brain. I, I mean, I've always referred to it as, as by Sagan's term with the, the onboard computer. Right. And like, I, I just never said, okay, well, he gave me this. So I get this. It's just like, it's this flow of things that just happened. And as I go back and I look at the video, and again, that's the power of video is I can go back and I can point out, these are the things that happened. This is why these things happened. Even if I had no cognizance of it happening in the moment um but that onboard computer like that's that's where that comes from and we um practice is where you are programming the subroutines of your onboard computer you go to practice and somebody presents you pressure how do you respond to that? Okay, I'll, I'm going to respond with pressure in return. Okay, so that changes the fight. So now I get to back off of that. And how do they respond when I back off of that? Okay, so he's bringing range to me without pr applying pressure. Those are all the things that we do at practice. And that's the value of practice. That's, that's why we have to do that hard work. We're programming the onboard computer. We're programming the subroutines at practice. And then when you get to practice, and that's that's it gets back to that spiritual thing that we were talking about, where that is who you are. And as Tristan said, you're not stuck with who you are as a fighter. You get to change that. But once once you get into tournament, you just let the computer run and just execute. And it's either good enough or it's not. And if it's not, you go back and, and you you keep working on it. I think this is, you know, it, it's it's interesting. And I think we're gonna have, probably have another segment on this because uh, well, Sean. Uh, myself and and Bess actually brought this up because she really they, we all process the fight somewhat differently. Um, you know, for for Sean, for you, you you let that flow. Yes. For me and Rongvalder, we're breaking down that fight like we're twenty moves ahead. You know, yeah. <laughs> and and we're constantly analyzing what were the, our weaknesses, what's their weaknesses, uh, everything from. We're going to, we're going to relax our tension to bring them down, to bring their, you know, to our, our will increase that tension to make them hold tension in their body and wear them out. So it, it's interesting. I don't think there's one answer. I think, I think people process a fight differently. And I think that's a conversation we're going to try to have in the future. Uh, and that's, that's uh, uh, because there's been a, a number of, it's been fun because it's it's we've been uh, all kind of right. throwing this back and forth at each other. So you are absolutely correct to eat their own, right? Yeah. Right. It's, yep. I can't train you the same way I would train Sean. I can't train the two of you the same way I would work with Octa, right? I have to find in that training the way I need to communicate to him how he would see it, how he would react to it. And then hone, if there are weaknesses, we hone them. If there are no weaknesses, we set those aside. But as, as we're saying, the training, again, we recognize all of these aspects, facets, whatever you want to call them, of your own fighting. Recognizing spirit, mental and physical, and then as trainers, we agree upon how we are going to work with you to enhance them. and that's our job yeah that's it and that's exactly and that's i think why we started really that coach's corner scenario is to help people understand it's it's not all physical you know and and that we have to understand and learn how to understand and help people become the best they can be and in practicing that i mean it's real key sean wouldn't have been able to have that response had he not practiced his spatial awareness being able to understand how you how you exist with your opponent and your body awareness right and be in a position to where you can take advantage of that um, measure change 
So practicing that and getting the feedback, being a good enough coach or trainer or working with somebody to where when that stuff happens, it doesn't just happen. And then you spend weeks trying to figure out how you did that magical thing. Somebody can say, hey, you step back. And as their foot came off the ground, you initiated a forward mechanic. And now you can start storing that as a learning chunk. You can start understanding why you did that thing that you did. Work on feeling what you were doing. I really emphasize the, that bridge between mental and physical is feeling what you're doing. If I can get you to feel how something moves, it's easier for me to get that into your mind. Um, when I'm working with folks, I really try and emphasize on getting them to experience their fighting, not just from a technical write it down in a notebook, but how did you feel when you did that? Did yeah. you feel balanced? Did you need to move your foot a little bit more? How did the recovery feel? Could you recover tighter? What happens if you recover slower? And building that, that feeling network into there. And then when I'm feeling that intensity, when I'm feeling that spirit side, it's when that sword is moved through a path where it just feels amazing. And you know, way before you triggered it, that the fight's over and, and that that shot's gonna land. And so all of that is go, coming in concert, but really being aware of your own body and, and where you are at, then allows you to be aware of where your opponent is and where they have to be, where they can be, where they can cheat it and how you can manipulate their mind um, that's kind of one of my uh, measures when I'm training folks is how easy can I take control of their onboard computer? How fast can I pull them out of their lizard brain into that front thoughtful brain? Because as soon as you're, when you're in your lizard brain, you're responding. It, it wants to see a color and tell you what color it is. It wants to see numbers and add them up and tell you it's worth, it's 20. But when you, when you give somebody a puzzle, that they can't solve quick by your own mechanics or how you orient all of a sudden now they have to think and when they think they're slowing down you're taking them out of their you're, you're disengaging their spirit you're taking them out of their their lizard brain their onboard computer and now you're making them solve them and if you keep changing that problem they get slower and slower and the fight suddenly has a dynamic shift so practicing being able to maintain your own mental and spiritual game means that then you can use your own techniques and not have somebody else reprogram you during a fight. Um, practicing, uh, practice thinking your actions into being. There's a great book called The Gold Medal Mental Workout. I think that's what it's called. And in that, in that book and on that tape, it goes so far as to have you lay down on your back, put your hand down and think about moving a finger. And not just moving the finger, but think about it and feel the muscles move. I mean, it tears it down that far. So you really are building that mental awareness of your body. Uh, and, and in practice, being aware when you are using your puzzle solving brain up front and when you are using that onboard computer and practicing shifting back and forth. The way, you know, Bronis, you talk about it all the time where you're constantly analyzing the fight and you've stepped back, then you apply pressure, you step back. And I don't think that there's a big disengage between that no. on computer and that front brain, but you're allowing them to work in concert. One isn't, the front brain is never gonna over dominate the lizard brain. The, the, that, that big mind, that onboard computer is always in charge, but it's allowing that front brain to be a little more analytical here and there when it's safe to do that. Um, is that my, my close on that? <laughs> well, I, I think I, I'll throw something out on that. You know, one of the things that I talk about is as far as, you know, that the unconscious side of things and, and kind of letting, letting things, um, you know, I talk about allowing the fight to develop organically and naturally without having the fight happen to you. Yeah. Right. I mean, so that on, on the one, on the one side, you, you have to allow the onboard computer and the, the lizard brain to, to respond as you have trained it to do. Um, and, and you're kind of following along on the flow of the fight. Um, but the moment that you allow the fight happen, you know, there's, there's this, there's this razor thin edge between passive and aggressive where, um, where you're always ready to respond you know, offensively rather than simply de de defending something. Um, so to an extent, it's, it's allowing the fight to, to happen organically, but it's, it, 
because it is a razor thin edge, it's 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 a short trip to having the fight happen to you. I mean, you you can lose control of that really really fast if you're just trying to you know just let it be and 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 just let things happen as they're going to happen. I mean, you have to have some control um, of that, but you also have to you have to be able to respond to you know the the natural flow of what your opponent is doing as well. Um, that was something that, that Bruce Lee, you know, talked about a lot. Um, and, and it's something that, that, that Sagan talks about, you know, when we get into these preconceived notions about how a fight is going to happen, and that's the trap. Or right? well, how much better I am than that guy. Yeah. Ah, yeah. there we you go. Know? And that's the thing that Bronos was talking about is like that, that conscious. And I think, I think Bronos does it more consciously. I do it more subconsciously. Um, where it's like, I'm going to move here. Okay. Now we respond to that. Now I get to do this and I get to do this, these other things. And it's more, de more deliberate, more purposeful, more, more, more conscious, um, where I think I do it more by feel. Um, and I mean, the net result is, is the same. Like, it's just, how are you, how are you going to get there? Right. Ross? Yeah, I, I would agree hundred percent. I think, you know, it's interesting. Ron Valder's in the forum and he, he posted something. And I'm, I'm hoping I've got it right, but uh, he posted delusionary spirit. And I think what he means by that is, you know, this, this goes to that place where you are so confident that in yourself that you forget your opponent and, and you don't get that feel you're looking for, or, you know, you, you, you're not even testing them to really challenge and, and understand them. So you have to be careful on that that other line of spirit in, in that case. Um, and, you know, I, I think you're hundred percent right. I, I think there's, you know, there's, there's two things. One is you can over-process, which maybe that's where me and Ron Goller can fall every once in a while, but then you can also under-process. In other words, you are so into understanding what you normally do that you don't recognize what is actually happening or you're unable to make the change that has to happen against an opponent that you're not prepared for. Right. So, so there's weaknesses and, and those are the, all of these weaknesses are the pieces we're trying to resolve. And to, to, to speak to that a little bit too, another weakness, and it's, I am guilty of this all the time. And it's my hardest thing that I have to keep in check is I go overboard on the spirit side. I get, I'll go fight some of my favorite fighters like Duke Sven, Avantir, and all I want to do is surf the wave. I throw down the spirit and I climb on and I, I let the toes go all the way over the abyss and the, the, the mind is in there for to hang on and try and execute everything the spirit wants to do. And there's no more analytical thought. It's all feeling. It's all motion. It's nothing exists except, oh, somebody just got hit with a stick. And I fall into that because I enjoy that that exchange on that kind of ethereal level of just going. And that is a really easy thing to get stuck into as well, where you just overcommit spiritually and and roll the dice, so to speak. But when it's your passion, when it's our absolute passion, yeah. there are faults that come that will present themselves. And unfortunately, our wee little mind is so busy going. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, that we just let them happen. Sometimes you beat the wave, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't. <laughs> back, back to uh, his grace, you know, talking about the delusional mind. It's almost any lie you tell yourself, right? I can't do this. I'm not good enough. Uh, I always lose to Duke so-and-so. I can't fight against a great sword. In any of that, on the mental side, is defeatist. We've talked about it numerous times, so I'm not going to elaborate here. But again, it brings it forward that if you train in practice and then you perform, it will prove your training practice techniques. Tristan, did you have a? No, I, I, um, I actually have a very similar <clears throat> trait in my spirit too, where I just, I love getting in B range and just rocking and rolling. Um, it's when I first started fighting, I did it just out of pure joy that I got to get in armor and swing a sword. And it, it, like you said, it, it feeds your passion. It's not the smartest game, 
but yeah. it's sir it sure is fun it's like getting on a motorcycle and cracking that throttle open and just going yeah. um, and when you get an opponent of a level mm-hmm. where there's there's certain opponents where i try and lower the tempo because i know i can't out tempo them mm-hmm. and then sometimes it's great to just like i said throw your surfboard down and have them elevate you mm-hmm. because they're putting all of their passion into it and it's just it's exhilarating right. and uh you know to point out the deficiencies so as a fighter if i can beat you mentally then i don't have to work as hard physically musashi said it best punch them through the heart if i can if i can take your heart and your spirit out of the fight if i can find that little piece i always tease folks i said that fight i was sitting in the easy chair in your lizard brain with a bowl of popcorn watching the fight because i owned your mind I, I put in doubt i lied to you I cheated range. I did all these things to manipulate you into buying whatever I was selling. So a big goal of the mental and spirit game is to keep people out of that. I can tell when somebody's elevating and getting ready to get to that almost, we'll call it a nightly level, when I can't sit in that easy chair as easy and have my popcorn. When I can't just step in and immediately with a couple of, of subtle lies, take control of that mental fight, that's a shift. That's a huge shift in awareness in a fighter where they are starting to control their own mental aspect and their own spirit. You can't take that away from them. So uh, that's a huge part of the fight. I would say it's 80 to 90% of what we do is, is that. Mental yeah. and, and, you know, that's, that's, that's a good, that's a great point right there that, you know, it, it, people need to understand is at the highest levels of execution of our sport, our sport is 80% mental. Um, it is 80% mind game easily. And I think that's true of, of most martial arts, you know, that's why, you know, you see, you, you know, my, my, one of my favorite pictures is, uh, you know, Bruce Lee standing next to, next to Ip Man, you know, and you just, you just look at that old man and you're like, I'm just going to kick that guy's ass, you know, and you don't realize that he's been doing this for, you know, three times as long as you've been alive and the brain just gets smarter and the mind, the mind gets better at this. And it is, it's, it's at least 80% mental. And so, you know, and, and the, the, the hard part of that is in the beginning of our sport, it is, those numbers are reversed. It is 80% physical where you're finding out what a flat snap actually feels like, you know, and, and, and what does a flat snap feel like for your body? Not just an imitation of how I do it, but how does that, how, how does that feel for your body? So there's a lot of the physical stuff that, that is early on, um, but then at the highest executions of our sport, it is so much more mental. Um, and, and a lot of that is, a lot of that developing that is allowing it to happen. Um, and, you know, getting back again to the, to this, the, that, that mix of the spiritual and, and the, the mental, allowing it to happen and, and, and being comfortable with it. Cause one of the things that we do is we have this tendency oh, to train our body to such, to, to such an extent that, you know, it's like, we're trying to tell your body how to do this thing. Well, you've already taught your body and it knows what to do. And now you are trying to overtrain your body to get it to execute a certain thing when your body already knows what to do. And, and, and again, to Sagan's point, you have to get out of the way. You, you, you have to remove yourself from it and let your body do what you have trained it to do because you've trained it well and it knows what to do. And, and the hard part about the mental part of it is letting it do what you've taught it how to do. I could jump yeah, in I, there too, uh, oh. just real quick. Um, and this is what Sean describes is perfect for an intermediate to an advanced fighter who is at the point where they have trained their body to do the movements that are needed. If you are beginning or are still in that phase where you're in the 80% physical, you're trying to sort out your footwork, you're trying to sort out your body mechanics, and you're think you're listening to this discussion and going, oh yeah, I got to get that 80% mental. No. What you're going to do is you're going to jam yourself up. Your body isn't going to move correctly. You're going to try to work on mental. It won't work because your brain is trying to figure out how your body's supposed to work. You're basically going to be trying to stuff 10 pounds of crap in a five pound bag. Um, so the recommendation is to be patient. Take the time you need to go through and train your body how to how to work. Don't shove the mental part in there too soon. Uh, let your body sort it out. And what you will feel is 
you'll start to notice I don't, I'm not thinking about my footwork anymore. I'm not thinking about shot mechanics anymore. I'm thinking about where I should put a shot, but I'm not thinking about how I should actually do it. When you start noticing that, let go of thinking about your footwork. Cause I've seen people that will constantly obsess about, I need my flat snap to be better. And they'll do this for years or they'll, they'll work on, they'll continue working on the ABCs when they should be learning vocabulary and grammar. They should have moved on from ABCs to the mental. There's a natural shift in there. And, and I think the let it happen suggestion from Sean is perfect, but don't rush it. If you try to rush it, you're going to just log jam yourself. And that's what, was what I think Sagan was talking about earlier in the episode of we get in our way by trying to either go too fast or go too slow. Well, and there's an, there's an evolution of training. We train new fighters first to throw good techniques. Then we teach them combos and reactions. Mm -hmm. And then later, as they progress, we break those combos into individual deliberate actions. And we try and push reactions into responses. And that's when that mental shift happens. And it's good for everybody to know that there is this mental and spiritual part of fighting, but it's going to be this, we're building a pyramid, hopefully the right way up, not pointy side down. And we start with all the good techniques. We start with this and, and there's this shift. Once you have that foundation, now you can start paying attention to this stuff. And, and all along the ways, and I have it down further in my notes, but stress testing. So working with somebody, and when I feel that somebody's getting in their way, they're thinking too much, they're getting frustrated, we play a new game. And I turn off any mind games, I turn off any lying, and I push them to get out of the front of their brain. I don't give them any problem except what's right in front of their face. Whatever kind of fight needs to happen for them to feel that, but I try and push them into just being responsive. They, they All they can do is respond because if they think they're going to get hit, and not trying to make it a, a trial by pain because I'm absolutely not trying to hit hard, but I'm trying to force them into, maybe it's a footwork thing. I want to get them to move. So I start to move really aggressively and around and, and get them to stop thinking about it and just do it. And then we stop and we talk about it. Hey, how did that feel right then and there? You just stepped perfectly. You weren't thinking about it. How did it feel? And so to immediately acknowledge that growth point so that they can experience that feeling and then we'll do it again because some people just need a kickstart to get out of their head as well and you can facilitate that without punishing them but giving them a stress test to kind of see how their mind's going to react and you or maybe there's a deficiency maybe i had a squire brother and every once in a while he would do a mechanic and i would literally bend over at the waist and he would hit me in the back of the head didn't know what the trigger was, but three or four times at a practice, that would happen. And I'm like, what is going on? So trying to figure out what those mental deficiencies are through a bit of a stress test. And, and I think all the way along, giving somebody that kind of a training to where they can experience just what are their reactions? What are their lizard brain responses? When do they shift from responsiveness to reactionary in their fighting? Um, no. Just, uh, I'm going to cover a couple of things real quick, just because there was a, a lot of stuff right there. And I'm going to let Octa catch up on his topics and make sure he can get through them all. Because uh, this is a really complex topic. And I think, you know, I, a number of us, we all wanted to participate in this because it's, I think for us, it's some of the most important parts of our game now. Yeah. Uh, and I think this goes back to what Sean said that, you know, 80% you know, you're 80% mental in the end, a, a mental game in the end. And, and it was funny. I had another Duke tell me that right at the beginning of my career when I was very physical and, uh, and I was like, whatever, old man, move on. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, I, I guess the, the, the piece is, I think we start in that place where we're 80% physical and then we migrate to that 80% mental. And so, Give, and like Sean said, and, and Octa said, and Tristan said, and Sagan says, give yourself that time to do that. Don't be in a rush. Otherwise, you forget how to get there. So you don't have the physical skills to create the mental skills. Even if you do get the mental skills, you don't have the physical skills to back it up. Right. So you might see the shot, but you can't do it. And I hear this all the time. It's like, oh, I saw that. It doesn't matter if you saw it. Because to tell you the truth, that was in that time. You're not going to be able to throw it anyways. What you did is you saw it, so you should be able to create it again and then throw it. It's, you're not going to do it at the same time, usually. 
um, on that point too, you know, I tend to like almost every practice I have, I'll cover parts of what's in the next practice. And some of it can be complex. So I'll, I'll be like, I'll cover stuff I know they're not gonna understand because I want them to take a week to think about it and, and, and allow it to sink in. So it's not a shock in the next practice where they just shut down. Now they've had time to think about what I, okay, this is coming. I'm, I, I calm down. I'm not shocked. I'm, you know, all of those pieces. So now when I say it again, they're willing to listen and try to understand what we're talking about. So, you know, when you're training people, make sure you inject what's coming next, especially if you know that thing coming next is probably over their head or they, something may, maybe they've never heard before. That, that helps the, the, you know, the, your person you're training a tremendous amount. Um, last piece, um, because Tristan covered this one and it, it, this is a fun one. Um, there is nothing like a great fight. You should have them at practice all the fuck, all, all the time, sorry. Um, <laughs> you know, we can say fuck. but <laughs> when you, you know, the hardest part for me is training people how to have a boring fight. And what I mean by that is, that perfect fight where you 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 essentially do exactly what you need to do to execute perfectly and that could be very boring if you're doing that all the time it's not exciting shouldn't be exciting because if you're excited you your your brain is working on something different you're you're working on you know a lot of people want to go right to that that place where the endorphins, you know, it's like, oh, this is great, you know, and, and then you lose control and you lose the ability to think clearly. And that's, that's a really hard place to get to. It takes time, it takes effort, and it really takes dedication to allow yourself to get there. Awesome. Absolutely. So uh, part of the whole training, um, the evolution from that part of getting from that physical to the mental is understanding how you and your opponent impact one another. Uh, so we always talk about feedback, um, developing your when, your why, and your where. You can throw the best flat snap in your kingdom, but if you don't know when, why, or where to throw it, then it's worthless. So I've seen so many people throw, and they are awesome at hitting that front corner of the shield or the middle of the shield because they're just so out of touch with the when, the why, and the where. Or the bottom point. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a I think that's an important development and evolution to work with with your students and with your trainers is developing that when why and where um, it's and it's heartbeats right our sport it's somebody blinks and that could have been your when absolutely and and and, and recreating that it's okay if you saw it but missed it how can you recreate it um so viewing the fight, that's part of the mental game. Learning how to interpret the fight as you're going through it. From the moment, if we're talking about a tournament, from the moment you step on the field, and, and I have more about go time mindset in just a few minutes here, um, to, to where the fight ends. Always have your eyes in the fight. That's, I hate it when somebody loses a fight because they blinded themselves or because they disengaged from the fight. Watch that, know why you won, know why you lost know why you threw that blow uh, video it's great because oftentimes and sean and i were talking about this earlier you have a belief that a, a, a interaction went a certain way and you go back and watch the video and i'll be damned i i didn't do anything like i thought i did where the hell was my my i was too too impassioned i was too into my spirit and i totally lost track of, of how that technique was going down or how that interaction happened so with that mentally applying pressure understanding how your stance is going to change that doesn't need to be a big physical front brain thing just adjusting your stance adjusting your measure range um, changing your lines i always have a belief if you can control line two out of the line um, measure and tempo you can you are controlling the fight and you have to do that sometimes that's a very big mental game small little shifts intensity we talked about that with spirit you walk out with somebody and you really want to hit them in the temple and you see it and you're so intense, people will feel that and they'll back off. I've had people do that to me. We all in the fight, 
and I'm ready to go. And just before I, I throw a blow, they step back and I laugh and they're like, yeah, I felt that. I didn't want any part of that. So controlling how you emote your spirit. I call it the gentle bunny. You go pull all that intention inside and just, hey, little bunny, we're all good. I just want to pet you. I just, you know, and then boom, you, you change the tempo, you change your intensity. So being able to mentally and spiritually control your posture, your intensity, that's all part of that evolution and training as you get up to that 80%. One of the well, things and, I think and, people overlook on this is they get geared up to go out onto the field and they're thinking entirely about themselves. They're thinking of their own mindset, their own spirit set, their own physical tools. They're thinking about what's the length of my sword. You know, they're thoroughly self-absorbed. And what they give up on is reading their opponent, reading their opponent's spirit. Sun Tzu, know your, know your enemy and know yourself. And in a hundred battles, you'll never be in peril. Don't get so self-absorbed with your own performance that you completely overlook your opponent. And, and I love that, that story that you told Octa of, of your opponent that read you and then just backed off. That was the simplest way to shut you down was just, he read you felt the pressure and just shifted back. And, and he was able to take control just for that one moment and make sure you didn't take control of him. And I've seen many, many people do it. And the more competitive the venue, the higher the ante, the more they think about themselves and they fail to read what their opponent's doing, what mindset their opponent's in or what their opponent's spirit is and how, then therefore how to deal with it. Cause once you, once you sense it, now the mental side kicks in of, okay, what am I going to do about it? What's the best way to handle this person who's in a, maybe a hyper assertive or hyper aggressive mindset, or maybe they're passive and frightened and reactionary that will change how you approach once the lay on is called. Um, so you know, and I've seen people that have got not terribly good physical skills, but do an exceptional job of reading their opponent. And they only use the minimal tools they need to get the job done. You don't need to be a physical specimen to excel at SCA combat. And Lord knows you look around at the, <laughs> at the physical build of a lot of high, high, high end fighters, and you do not see Olympic level athletes. Um, but when you can read an opponent and draw them in, or somehow manipulate them into where you want them to be, then finishing them off, then that's your 80% mental side. Right. You're not in that high end athleticism right. requirement to, to prevail in a fight. Right. Yeah, and, and I think there's an, there's another example there of, of uh, you know, losing a fight without actually having thrown a blow. True. Mm -hmm. right. 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 Because a fight one way or the other is either a relationship, one way or the other. And if I can change it into a partnership where you're willing to do what I want, well, all of a sudden now this is, this is better for me than it is for you. But being aware that those things exist, you know, being again on the mental side, being aware that, you know, this, this seems to be going my way. Well, it could be going your way because it is or it could be going your way for another reason. And that's where when we get into the mental side of observation and things like that, and we train into that, you know, and you start asking your training, so why do you think I did that? Right? Where, where, we, where we're into Branos is probing and we're like, oh, okay, I see what he's doing. So now I'll feed him misinformation. Most people are not gonna do that, right? Because Branos is so accomplished that he's going to be, he's going to be doing things that it's like, do it this way. Okay. Now do it that way. Did I get the same result? No. Okay. Now we'll go on to probe C and we'll see what we get there. But the idea is a lot of it is about mental on both sides. What did you see? What did you get? And that's what you saw and what you got last time. What you see and what you get the next time may not be the same thing. And mindset changes as the fight goes on. Just That's because they start a fight in a certain mindset, and you do, does not mean that it would stay that, that stays that way. Absolutely. You can fail on starting out with a good mindset and falter, as well as drawing your opponent into faltering, or merely like playing tennis, waiting for them to error. If you're still there when they make their error and you're ready, that will probably be the end of it, as long as you're prepared. And, and that 
that's another part of understanding yourself so that you can understand your opponent. Part of that is how do you recover from that? How do you recover from being programmed by your opponent if you manage not to die? You need to be able to practice that. You need to be able to take a breath and reset, not just physically, but mentally reset yourself with whatever. I see a lot of people have little rituals, the shield mechanic, they'll roll their shoulders to get reset or what have you and uh, find what it takes for you to recover, reset and re-enter the fight. And as you do that more and more, just like practicing a flat snap, you become better and faster and more precise. Because part of this whole evaluation is seeing the truth and the lies and the perceptions. The more you lie to yourself, the easier my job is to lie to you. Absolutely. I think you're nailing it there, Octa. I think, you know, that's, that's the big piece is sometimes you almost want to try to let people get overconfident and take advantage of that. Um, but the reset is critical. And understand the faster you can reset, then the faster you can take away a reset from your opponent. In other words, just to back out of a fight allows both opponents to reset. Now, you, you have to be careful uh, if you're trying to break them down physically and you back out to reset mentally or spiritually, then you're allowing them to reset physically. So you have to be a little careful. So the, 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 there's a place in there where you actually practice that, you know, being able to reset and set your heart rate and your breathe, your breath and all of those things while still at the edge of range. And oh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Doctor. I was going to say one of my favorite places to reset is a range. One of my favorite things to do is go marsupial. I climb into my opponent's little pouch. <laughs> And then they don't I have a they don't have a pouch, Doctor. Or you just you just make a pouch? I just make a pouch, man. That's <laughs> my He's but in his own pouch, your grace. Come on. Thing is, if, your opponent, if my opponent is starting to out-tempo me and I can get into that A range and take a breath and just make a show of lowering the intensity of the fight, all I'm doing is resetting and relaxing so I can go fast. And so if I can get my opponent and I call it driving the school bus. I make everything big and I just get in the way. I'm a big wet blanket and I'm just trying to emote slow non-tension onto this fight. I want them to still feel uncomfortable, but it's my chance to reset. So now I'm maintaining all that pressure that Brownus likes to make people feel. It's a horrible, icky feeling, but I'm relaxing and I'm inside a comfort area because I've practiced fighting in here over and over again. So it's, it's not a pucker area for me to be in. And that's how I like to reset. Now I don't have to worry about exiting and giving my opponent the chance to uh, to reset mentally. And, and really, with some folks, you get in there, and now they're uncomfortable. You can feel it, and then they try and get you out of there. So then you just sort of relax and hang out in there, and then you watch the whole Yoda thing happen. You get, you get fear, and then you get anger, and then you get all the way down till it's nothing left but sorrow and self-deprecation, and then you kill your opponent because they've already beaten themselves. Their spirit is gone. You punched them through the heart. And, and now you take the fight away. Right. And you get him in that WTF moment of, of indecision. Un, I'm very uncomfortable. What are they doing? And, and all of a sudden, the mental side, the mental side goes right out the window. You right? While you're in there nice and cozy and you're just sitting here going, yeah, I'm yeah, this is where I want to be. And you're watching through their ocularium. They're going, they are just about to lose it. Right. Yep. And then, of course, conversely, <clears throat> then there's that opponent that doesn't. Yeah. And it's like, okay, here we go. Right. Nope. But as His Grace Panos has said before, though, you know, keeping that physical pressure on, keeping the mental pressure on, you know, it's exhausting to some fighters. It really is. Right. And to where they need to understand when that happens, well, that's His Grace's way of fighting. Recognize it. And now what are you going to do? Because well, and and, and I, I just I, break. It's up to you to gain your break. Yeah. Yeah, I just made the comment on the live thread there that the emotional expenditure in our fight oh, is exhausting. Oh yeah. And, and yeah. that is part of the mental side of the fight that we're talking about and developing the mental side is you have to control the mental ex the the emotional expenditure that you're that you're putting out there. <clears throat> because when you get this you know, this thing like, 
uh, you know, performance anxiety and I have to, I, I have to do well in this fight or I have to win this fight or whatever. Um, there is an emotional cost there that a lot of people just do not account for. And it is physically exhausting. And, and yeah, Sagan had, had just triggered that comment. Yeah. So we've covered a lot of stuff. There's one more thing that I, I feel is everybody's Achilles heel is um, shifting from a practice mindset to a competitive mindset to a go time. Um, we show up and it, it really starts from the moment you get in the car to go to an event. Um, but you have to practice that. You can't just show up to an event, put your armor on, go out in the marshals, you'll lay on and, and you haven't shifted from a practice mindset to a go mindset. Um, there's a whole lot of of, of real estate in between <laughs> that practice and that go time. Uh, there's rituals that everybody everybody comes up with. And those can be, I know people that have rituals when they pack their car for an event. All the way to, my biggest problem was every time somebody interrupted a ritual, it screwed me up. If I walked onto the Eric and I walked on from a side that I hadn't fought in yet, it would screw me up. Somebody talked to me before I was putting my helmet on, it would screw me up. So I'm on the other side. My ritual doesn't start until I cross the Eric road, until I go into the Eric. And then from that point on, as soon as I cross in, there's like this magic screen and work stays in the armor bag, uh, setting up the tent, the hot day, whatever stays in the armor bag, uh, everything but the fight that's about to happen stays in the armor bag. And my brain, as soon as I step on the field, the information gathering part of that is just rolling and spinning from what my opponent, how they step, what are they fighting with that mindset. Now it's just hunting. I'm hunting for information. And part of it is out of respect. If I go to fight Sean in a tournament, he doesn't, he doesn't or should not have to fight my bad day at work, my argument with my kid or not being able to find my fighter card. That's just not okay. He deserves the absolute best game that I can give him on that day. And so does the person that's only been fighting for a week because they paid the price to ride the ride. They put in the sweat of learning how to throw a flat snap. They deserve the absolute best fight, whether that's a flat snap to the temple in the first four seconds, or it's 15 minutes of drawn out, just mental and physical warfare. Uh, what do you guys do for sh that mental shift? What, how do you help people find that mental shift? Well, I, I know I have I have a, a on field ritual. Uh, I think I think many of us do, um, and and really for me the it's the um, the process of, of that 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 exists in every tournament. You know, saluting the crown, saluting the the person who's favor your bearer, saluting your opponent. Um, that is all part of my ritual, um, and and I agree with you, Octa, that 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 it's the on field ritual um, because. You know, again, when when you're when you have this these things that have to happen before you get to the field, and then somebody interrupts that, which happens all the time, you know, and then that throws you off, right? Um, but when I get to the when I get to the list, um, you know, that whole process of saluting those salutes is ritualistic to me. Um, you know, because one of the things that, that I do in, in that is um, I will only uh, take a knee when I'm saluting my consort and I'll take a moment and there, there is that, that moment between my consort and myself. And uh, after that, everything shuts off. You know, before I engage in combat, my consort is the last thing that I see. And yep. once, I, once I make that salute to her and I recognize her, everything else goes away. I'm very much a zone fighter in that way, where I'm like, like as soon as, as, soon as I make that, that salute, um, everything, including my consort, goes away. And now I am doing combat. But it, yeah, that is very ritualistic to me. Um, and so as, as far as the, the mental side of how we do these things, um, you know, um, Carl Malone, who was a, you know, phenomenal, you know, basketball player in the, for the Utah Jazz, uh, was one of the best free throw shooters in history. 
And he had this process that he would go through where he would dribble the ball seven, three times, and then he would mutter something under his breath to himself. And they had like, like lip readers who could never tell what it was that he was saying and that sort of thing. But it was like, you know, dribble the ball X number of times. You see, he spins the ball in his hands like three times or whatever. And then he mutters this thing and then boom, swish, right? Like 90%, right? And that was all ritual. And, you know, when you have the people that are under the basket that are waving their batons and all this other bullshit that they're doing to distract somebody like that, it doesn't matter. It does not matter because a player like that does not see any of that because they were so embroiled in the ritual. And that ritual is so much a part of, again, the spirituality. That ritual is so much a part of who they are that it doesn't matter what anybody else is going to do. That can't that will not interrupt what they're doing because this is who they are. And so, yeah, having that ritual, yeah, absolutely a part of who I am as a fighter. And One like thing I want to jump in with is that the, the, the ritualization is a kind of a benefit of, of sport fighters who have time before about to go through rituals, to design them, the, the ramp up time. And, and just as a kind of a parallax view from the self-defense realm, you can wind up in a fight in a matter of seconds. Like you don't have time to go through your ritual to get in your mindset. So it's not absolutely necessary. If you train yourself to not need a ritual to be able to drop the fangs in less than a second and a half or two seconds, that is possible. Now, the one thing that I would say, and, and Octa actually described this really well, of developing your own ritual is that it can get disturbed. It can get interrupted. And I mean, I've seen, I've seen at crowns where people are, have got their headphones on and they listen to whatever music gets them in the mindset, you know, that takes time. What happens when you don't have it? What happens when your music, you, the battery's dead, you know, all of these things, you be careful of, of where you put your investment of your mind, because if it fails, it can, it can bite you. Um, other people like to do warm ups, sparring for half an hour to get loose and warmed up. What happens when you have to fight cold? Will you go into a tournament and lose twice because you haven't done your warm up ritual? So you can adjust these things through how you approach setting up and saying, What do I? You can have a ritual. That's fine. My suggestion would be make it as short and sweet as possible so that it cannot be interrupted. Um, the, the one that I enjoyed the most is just putting my helmet on. As soon as that thing slid down over my head, it was game time and the fangs were, were dropped and were ready to go. Um, Maybe I'm just not a ritual guy, but, um, you know, I've seen a number of people come away from crown and be like, I just like Octa said, I got interrupted. I, people were chattering at me and congratulating me and saying, oh, I was going to win. And, and that got me all out of sorts or at my concert and I weren't getting along with an argument last night or whatever, all of that stuff is, can really interrupt you. So, um, you know, just, just from that self-defense side, it's when it's go time, you have to spot the threat and act without preparation and i think that's the key i mean for me it's the threat i'm on that field they can call a lay on it doesn't matter i step out there that guy across from me is my threat i'm gonna break him down and i'm gonna kill him. that's it i don't have a ritual for most part sure. so right uh, but so so just understand for everybody mm -hmm. you know it's these things do help you sometimes you do need the ability to focus and and Sometimes you do go in a fight, you know, even a real fight with, you know, a little soft on it, not really having it there. And then it could end fast, but if it doesn't, then it escalates fast. So, you know, the, the, the key is whatever helps you just make sure you understand how to get there and then how to get there faster. Right. Yeah. Just like recovery. Right. right. And the other thing is, is, is the recognition of what affects you mentally can affect your performance, right? Because it's a third of what we just talked about. And just recognizing that fact, Akka said, so the batteries went dead on, on, or Tristan said, the batteries went dead on your whatever, and you can't hear your music, or, you, or you're, you're talking to somebody and somebody, you know, interrupts, or something happens, or your leg strap breaks, or, you know, we could, we could list a myriad of things. And mentally, it has its weight. Why? Because you gave it that weight. 
And now that it has the weight, now it can affect things. Well said. And just, All right, guys, we're running out of time. Uh, just yep. to put a little click on that, because it's part of something Sean said that really means a lot to me. And this sport that we do at the highest levels, we don't aren't always just fighting for ourselves. We're fighting for our consort or our kings. And I find, especially in the spiritual, and it's taken me a lot of a lot of years to be able to even hold it in is that inspirate your inspiration when you salute that for me that increases my spirit tenfold the power that my inspiration gives me because they're my i get a foundation of trust because i'm they're allowing me to be on the field for them and don't um don't undersell that it's a huge amount that can that can that can offset a lot of self-doubt being able to carry that person's inspiration on the field with you. So I would practice that as well. But man, we covered a lot. We covered it. We covered it quick. We're just starting to run over. We got to wrap it up. Um, the mental and the spirit game practice, use it. Use it at practice. Find ways to pull spirit out of people you are training. Find ways to invoke and put your spirit onto folks that you are training with. Um, have people work on getting you out of your mindset, stress test, reevaluate truths. All of that stuff is a big part of that evolution from 80% physical to an 80% mental game. And it's deep. And it, 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 the beautiful thing is it takes a, a long time to master. So you got all this enjoyment along the way to figure it out. All right. So uh, let's uh, go ahead and wrap it up. Sean, uh, who, what do we got next week? Yeah, so uh, next week uh, we have a conversation with Duke Paul Bellatrix, um, one of the absolute icons of, of the training in our sport. Um, uh, you know, Sagan's not quite as familiar with him as some of us are. Yeah, right. Um, that was <laughs> right. Um, Sagan, you're going to join us next week? Yeah, you know, I, I think I have that one marked on every calendar I own. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, but yeah, Paul, yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's you know one of one of the one of the great fighters and one of the great trainers of our sports we're absolutely delighted to have him on uh next week so. yeah and the great part is uh we're gonna have him on a couple more times i've had a chance to uh train with him at so many different places uh we've gotten to know each other pretty well so um uh, he's looking forward to it i just talked to him and uh should be a great episode and then we're gonna he has some stuff he's working on that we'll present in another episode coming down the line uh, so, uh, look for a lot of good stuff coming forward for everybody. Yeah. Awesome. All right. And that, uh, anybody else got any final thoughts? Well, uh, just so everybody knows, uh, please remember, uh, there's lots of great content in the coach's corner database. Um, we are always adding content. Uh, also, uh, all of, please pass this on to your friends. Uh, I think there's a lot of, we're all getting back to fighting. You got new people, send them to Coach's Corner. You got, you know, you got people coming back, send them to Coach's Corner. There's all kinds of great content here. You can find it all on YouTube. Every session that we do, um, don't be afraid to reach out to us. Uh, we love to talk, uh, as you know. And um, hey, my last one is I'd like to uh, congratulate one of our coaches, uh, His Highness Sean, for not only winning uh, Artemisian Crown. Uh, but for also being put on vigil for the Pelican. And that is well, well deserved. Thank you, sir. Congratulations. I appreciate it. It's, I'm, I'm deeply honored by both. Well done. All right, wrap her up, Sean. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, great conversation over in the uh, over in the comments thread. Uh, we always really appreciate that sort of thing. Uh, there's there's so much great content out there. And it's just a reminder that, uh, you know, while while we are the primary coaches out here, um, it is it is all of you out there watching us that is making the Coaches Corner community um, happen and sharing with each other. So we really appreciate that. Um, Octa, thanks for leading us off on this one. Say again, Tristan, as always, uh, it's a pleasure working with you guys and we will uh, see you next week. So everybody have a good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. All. Good night.